In the late 1990s, Digitech released the XP series of four digital effects guitar pedals. There was the XP100 Whammy and Wah pedal, the XP200 Modulator, the XP300 Space Station, and the XP400 Reverberator. Each one had a unique set of effects, the XP300 Space Station being perhaps the most weird and desirable of them all, and also extremely rare and expensive if you want to buy one. People have been modifying these pedals for more than a decade, including clever hacks to make one pedal work like all four. I have an XP200, and I'd like to try some of these modifications. Now, I could follow one of the guides online, but I think it would be more interesting to start from scratch, learn how digital effects pedals work, and then improve on the existing hacks. In this first video, let's get to know the hardware and look over the schematics and see what we have to work with. If you want to learn more about how these pedals sound, I've linked some videos and articles in this video's description. So let's start on the outside. The pedal is made of steel and designed to withstand being kicked around on a stage. There's two foot switches. The top switch selects the kind of effect or the program being applied to the input signal. The number of the active program is displayed on the front on a green two-digit LED display. The bottom foot switch allows you to bypass the effect or enter a tuning mode on the side, there's a single audio input jack and an input level adjustment knob. There are two audio output jacks that can be used for stereo or the left jack can be used alone for monophonic output. There's a barrel connector for the power supply and a button you can use to group together your favorite effects for faster access when performing live. The expression foot pedal controls the sound of the effect, usually intensifying the effect in some way as the pedal is pushed down. On the bottom of the pedal is a chart of all the pedal's effects programs and what the expression pedal does for each program. Next, let's take a look inside the pedal. Getting inside is easy. Remove four screws on the back and lift off the panel. I desoldered a little circuit board attached to the expression pedal, unscrewed another board under the bottom foot switch, removed screws from the main circuit board, and removed the nuts from all the audio jacks. The main circuit board slid out with just a little effort. What's on the main board? Here's an 8-bit microcontroller based on the ancient but still incredibly popular Intel 8051 architecture. Here's a 32 kilobyte read-only memory, or EEPROM, which is likely storing all of the software for the pedal. Here's a 12 megahertz crystal, which looks to be the only timekeeping device on the board. And here's a tiny 128-byte reprogrammable persistent memory, or double EEPROM which is used to store the user's grouping of favorite effects and calibration data for the expression foot pedal. This is a very basic 8-bit computer running the show. Nearby is the Texas Instruments Digital Signal Processing, or DSP chip, the TMS57070. This does all the audio signal processing. There's virtually no official documentation on this chip. All I could find was a four-page document with some pinout and block diagrams. However, I learned this chip was used in a ton of turn-of-the-century digital audio equipment and has been substantially reverse-engineered. We'll get to that in a future video. The DSP chip is connected to some dynamic RAM, which is where audio data is stored for processing. The amount of RAM chips is different depending upon the model of the pedal and which kinds of audio effects it implements. The analog section is unsurprising, consisting of operational amplifiers, or op-amps, transistors, resistors, capacitors, a stereo analog to digital converter, and a stereo digital to analog converter. The power supply is very simple, just a few linear voltage regulators and a couple of diodes to rectify the AC power input, providing positive and negative voltages for the audio circuitry. The expression pedal comes through the case via this arm. It has an LED mounted on it that shines onto a phototransistor on the main board. The phototransistor detects how much light is shining on it, and that information is used to change some characteristic of the effect. There's a cute little bit of felt attached to the arm to keep outside light from leaking on the detector and interfering with the expression pedal's behavior. There are two tact switches for the two foot switches. One is mounted to the back of the main board, the other is mounted on its own board, screwed onto the case, and wired to the main board. Notice how the bottom foot switch and LED board seem to fit into the cutouts in the main board. 
These boards were still attached to the main board when the components were soldered on, making the manufacturing process a bit simpler. During final assembly, the boards were broken off and wired to the main board. While I'm in here, I might as well take off the plastic parts of the two foot switches. They clip into the steel chassis. If I pull on the plastic bits from the top side and press back on the retaining clips, they pop out. It should be no surprise that they're spring-loaded. There's lots of grit and grime underneath, and having these plastic bits detached should make cleaning a lot easier. The foot pedal comes off easily. Just three more screws and that's done. It's so filthy. Looking at the circuit board is certainly informative, but circuit schematics would help far more. Remarkably, the schematics for all four pedals can be found online. I spent some time comparing the schematics, and it's true, they're almost exactly the same hardware. The XP300 and 400 quadruple the RAM because those pedals have some delay and reverb effects that require larger audio buffers. Some XP100s had a microcontroller chip with built-in program ROM, so they left out the EEPROM chip and related components. And all the XP100s have a few different components that route the dry or unprocessed audio signal to one of the output jacks, instead of having stereo outputs like the other pedals. The XP400 has an undervoltage sensing component, while the others don't. I can't figure out why only the XP400 has this. Maybe there were some reliability issues with the pedals not powering on cleanly or getting in a bad state if the power supply voltage took a hit. Let's start with the power supply. There's nothing surprising here. This is a very standard design for a digital audio device. But I'd like to point out a few things on the schematic. First, the power supply runs off an alternating current or AC input. This is a simple way to get positive and negative supply voltages, which are desirable for analog audio electronics. You might also notice that there are two positive 5 volt regulators. One is labeled plus 5VD and the other is plus 5VA. One powers the digital circuitry while the other powers the analog audio circuitry. This is commonly done to keep electrical noise generated by the digital electronics from leaking into the analog circuitry and ruining the audio signals. Speaking of noise, there are three separate ground symbols used in the schematics. The rake-shaped ground symbol is the chassis or case ground, the striped triangle is the digital ground, and the empty triangle is the analog ground. The analog and digital grounds are connected together at only one point in the schematics. Keeping them otherwise separate allows the circuit board designer to physically separate the ground wiring so that noise on the digital ground doesn't leak into the analog ground and circuitry. Now let's trace through the audio path, piece by piece. Starting at the audio input jack, we see it's connected to the analog ground when no cable is plugged in, via the switch mechanism built into the jack. This keeps the pedal quiet when there's nothing connected. This is a ferrite bead. You'll see one of these on every signal entering or leaving this pedal. It keeps high frequency electrical interference from entering the pedal and contaminating the audio signals. It also keeps electrical noise generated by the pedal's digital circuitry from escaping the pedal and interfering with other nearby electronics. Resistor R1 forms a high pass filter with DC blocking capacitor C57. This capacitor keeps small DC voltages from accumulating through the audio signal path and reduces the potential for unintended distortion and clicking and scratching sounds. We'll see many more of these DC blocking capacitors as we look through the analog circuitry. The first amplifier uses a non-inverting topology and amplifies the input signal by a factor of two, or six decibels. This gain is determined by the resistors in the amplifier's feedback path, R10 and 11. But wait, there's also this resistor and capacitor in parallel with R11 that combines with the resistance of R11 and causes an increase in gain above about 1.6 kilohertz. If we pretend the capacitor is a short circuit, which it is at high frequencies, we can calculate the gain of the bump is 3, or 9.5 decibels. So why did they add this extra resistor and capacitor? The high frequency bump they cause gives the pedal a brighter tone, which is often desirable for a lead instrument like a guitar. There's another DC blocking capacitor, and then we're at the second amplifier. This amplifier uses an inverting topology, 
So the gain is negative, determined by the ratio of the feedback resistor and the input resistor. The feedback resistance is set by variable resistor P1, which is adjustable with a knob on the side of the pedal. The knob's resistance goes from 0 to 100 kilo ohms. When at 0 ohms, the gain of the amplifier is 0, and no audio passes through the amplifier. With the knob turned the other way, to 100 kilo ohms, the amplifier's gain is negative 4.55. There's also this capacitor in the feedback path. It forms a low-pass filter with the feedback resistor. It has the effect of reducing the amplifier's gain at high frequencies. This is common practice to make sure the amplifier doesn't self-oscillate. Since the frequency of this low-pass effect is also determined by the feedback resistance, and the feedback resistance is controlled by the input gain knob, the low-pass filter's frequency changes when the input gain knob is changed. When the knob is at maximum resistance and maximum amplifier gain, the low-pass effect decreases the gain above roughly 13 kHz. I measured the frequency response at maximum input gain, and you can see that frequencies above about 10 kHz are reduced significantly. As a result, the pedal may sound a bit less crisp when operated with maximum input gain. Next, I decreased the input gain knob by about 10 decibels. That also increases the feedback filter frequency. Measuring the frequency response again, you can see that it's decreased about 10 decibels, but also it's almost flat, except for the small bump at about 1.6 kilohertz caused by the first amplifier's design. At this point, we've amplified and filtered the input signal. Since this is a digital effects pedal, the next step is to digitize the signal so we can process it digitally. That's done by this analog to digital converter or ADC chip. The audio it digitizes is then sent to the DSP chip. Before entering the ADC chip, the audio signal goes through one more filter. The ADC's digitization process can be distorted by noise at very specific high frequencies. We're talking megahertz here. This simple RC low-pass filter has a cutoff frequency of 159 kilohertz and effectively removes the frequencies the ADC is sensitive to. There's another DC blocking capacitor, which adapts the audio signal to the ADC's input requirements. The signal before the DC blocking capacitor is centered around 0 volts, but the ADC requires the signal be centered around 2.4 volts. The capacitor allows the DC voltage offset to be different on each side, while allowing the audio signal to pass through. You may have noticed that this is a stereo ADC. It has two analog inputs. And you might be wondering, what's that stuff connected to the right channel, AINR? Hold that thought, we'll talk about that in a bit. There's one more thing I'm curious about. What is the audio sampling rate? With the oscilloscope, I probe the LRCK signal on the ADC, which should toggle at the sampling rate, and measured 46.84 kilohertz. That's an odd sampling rate. Looking at the ADC's datasheet, it requires an input clock, MCLK, of 256 times the sample rate. If we multiply 46.84 kilohertz by 256, we get 11.991 megahertz. That's very close to the frequency of the 12 megahertz crystal we found on the board. They must be using that frequency to derive the audio sample rate. It would have been more expensive to add another crystal oscillator just to get a standard 48 kilohertz rate. When this pedal is only interfacing with the outside world by analog means, does it really matter if it's not operating at a standard sampling rate? The answer is definitely no. Before we move on from the input section, there's something I skipped. The signal and clipping indicators. Audio equipment works best when fed a signal that's strong enough to overcome circuit noise while not being so strong that it overloads the circuits and causes undesired distortion. The pedal has a green signal LED and a red clip LED to help the user decide if their input signal needs to be turned up or down. To do this, the design takes the audio input signal after it's gone through the second amplifier, but before it goes into the ADC. A transistor rectifies the signal and shifts it in voltage, then capacitor C1 smooths it. This is a kind of peak detector. The peak detector signal goes to two op amps being used as voltage comparators. When the peak detector signal becomes higher in voltage than the op amp's comparison voltage, the op amp lights up its LED. 
The comparison voltages are made using a voltage divider, consisting of a series of resistors between the plus 5 and minus 5 volt supply voltages. We can compute the voltages between the resistors with a little math. First we add up all the resistances, 137 kilo ohms, and observe the voltage difference across the total resistance, 10 volts. Using Ohm's law, voltage divided by resistance equals current, we can calculate the current through the resistors, 73 microamps. With a different form of Ohm's law, current times resistance equals voltage, we can calculate the voltage across each of the resistors. So let's start with R4. 62 kilo ohms of resistance times 73 microamps of current through the resistor equals 4.526 volts across the resistor. We know that one end of R4 is tied to negative 5 volts, so if we add the 4.526 volts across the resistor, we get negative 0.474 volts for the other end of R4. That's also connected to the bottom comparator, which is connected to the signal LED. So negative 0.474 volts is the comparison voltage for the signal LED. We can use the same technique to calculate the top comparison voltage for the clip LED, which comes out to 1.497 volts. I used my multimeter to check the comparison voltages and verify that my calculations were correct. The two comparison voltages are very close, negative 0.468 volts for the signal LED and positive 1.494 volts for the clip LED. This is well within the tolerances of the resistors and supply voltages. Then I applied a test signal so that the signal LED just barely lit up and checked the peak detector voltage going into the comparators, negative 0.465 volts maximum, very close to the negative 0.474 volts we calculated. Bumping up the test signal to just barely light up the clip LED, we see positive 1.467 volts on the oscilloscope. Again, that's quite close to our plus 1.497 volt calculation. I'd chalk up most of this error to my hasty adjustment of the input gain knob. The next step in the audio signal path is the DSP chip, but I'd rather finish up the analog part first. The DSP chip sends its output in the form of digital audio samples to the digital to analog converter or DAC. The DAC turns those digital samples into an analog audio signal. The left and right DAC outputs are followed by op amps configured as buffers, or amplifiers with a gain of 1. You can tell they're buffering because the output is fed back directly into the negative input, which causes the amplifier output voltage to match the input voltage. These buffers are there to give the DAC output signals a bit of a boost for driving the circuitry downstream. Like the ADC chip, the DAC is powered from a single 5 volt supply. Because of this, its output signals are offset by about 2.3 volts. Those DC offsets need to be removed, and that's what's done by the DC blocking capacitors C62 and C63. After the DAC and the buffers, we see an interesting conglomeration of JFET transistors being used as switches, controlled by logic signals from the microcontroller. The two logic signals are labeled wet and dry. The JFETs controlled by the wet signal connect the DSP, or processed output, to the audio output. The JFETs controlled by the dry signal connect the audio input signal to the output. These JFET switches are how the pedal provides its bypass function, which passes the input audio through the pedal unmodified. Initially, I thought maybe these JFETs could finally control the blend of dry and wet signals, and therefore the strength of the effect the pedal produces. But in probing around, I haven't seen any evidence that these switches can be turned partially on or off. In any case, the control signals from the microcontroller are 5 volt logic signals. The transistors invert the voltage, swinging between positive 5 volts and negative 5 volts when the logic signals go from 0 to 5 volts. In effect, the microcontroller outputs are active high mute signals. When a logic signal is high, the respective JFET switch opens up, preventing the signal from passing through. The resistor and capacitor low-pass filters smooth or slow down the switching signals so they don't make popping sounds when switched on or off. These JFET switches are one significant difference between the XP100 and the other models. 
The XP100 schematic shows that the JFET in the dry audio path is omitted or left off the circuit board. Instead, the missing JFET is bypassed by a zero ohm resistor, and the path from the DAC's write output is broken by emitting the DC blocking capacitor and a JFET. These wiring differences in the XP100 change the pedal's write audio output into a pass through of the audio input. This also means that enhancing an XP100 to perform as an XP200, 300, or 400 requires more missing components to be sourced and soldered onto the circuit board. The last part of the audio signal are the outputs. Dry and wet signals are combined through resistors and the JFET switches into inverting op amps. The feedback path around the op amps makes their negative inputs act like a virtual ground. The current flowing through the JFET switches add together at the op amp negative input. Kirchhoff's law says the current leaving a node in a circuit must equal the current entering the node. Since the op amp's input doesn't draw any significant current, all the current from the dry and wet signals must leave through the feedback resistor. That's a long-winded way of saying that the gain through the amplifier is the ratio of the feedback and input resistances. But the input resistance can be different for each signal that contributes current to the op-amp input node. This is a common way to make an analog audio mixer or otherwise combine multiple audio signals into one output. In this case, the pedal uses 22 kiloohm resistors for both the dry and wet signals, and also in the amplifier feedback path. So the gain for both signals is minus 22K over 22K, or negative 1.0. The dry and wet signals are therefore mixed together in equal measure. But there's a capacitor and a series resistor and capacitor in the feedback loop. I think the single capacitor is there to clean up high frequency noise generated by the DAC's Delta Sigma modulator. The datasheet describes a filter requirement, and this capacitor seems to perform that function. The series resistor and capacitor seem to be more subtle tailoring of the frequency response. The last things we see on the output are a reverse of what we saw on the input, a high-pass filter that blocks DC voltage offsets, and a ferrite bead that prevents very high-frequency electrical noise from entering or escaping the pedal. And that's the analog audio signal path. Now for some of the more peculiar and interesting stuff. First, we have the mono SNS, or monophonic output sensing mechanism. This detects if a cable has been attached to the right output. The microcontroller makes use of this information, probably changing the audio effect so it sounds good when heard through only the left output. When a plug is present in the right output jack, the mono SNS signal is connected to ground through the jack switch. When a plug is removed, the signal is pulled up to 5 volts by resistor R29. That signal is connected to the microcontroller's T0 pin. The expression pedal is especially interesting. As I mentioned earlier, the position of the expression pedal is measured by a phototransistor on the main circuit board. The pedal has an LED attached to it, and as that LED gets closer to the phototransistor and more light from the LED shines on the phototransistor, the output of the phototransistor changes. After probing around for a while with the oscilloscope and covering the phototransistor to various degrees, it looks like the phototransistor is changing the amplitude of a 20 kilohertz square wave. When the phototransistor has lots of light shining on it, the square wave's amplitude decreases to zero. It pretty much disappears. But when covered up, when there's little or no light shining on it, the amplitude of the square wave is more than three volts. Why go to all this trouble to turn something into a square wave that could just be a voltage? It has to do with the hardware available to the pedal designer. Microcontrollers these days have lots of ADC channels available in them, and those ADCs would be perfect for digitizing the expression pedal's phototransistor output. But the microcontroller chips in these pedals don't have any analog to digital converters. So what can be done? How will the microcontroller get the phototransistor signal if it doesn't have an ADC? That's a trick question. It doesn't. Think back to the audio ADC part of the schematic. This pedal has only a single audio output, and therefore only needs one of the audio ADC inputs. Did Digitech leave the other ADC input fallow, unused? Of course not. Instead, they used it to digitize the expression pedal's phototransistor signal. But there's a problem. 
audio ADCs are not designed to capture DC voltages, as they'd be inaudible anyway and could interfere with accurately capturing the audible portion of an audio signal. So the ADC is designed to filter out DC. But the output of the phototransistor could well be DC, or close enough to DC if the user isn't moving the pedal. How do we capture the pedal's position if the ADC is blocking DC? We can use the phototransistor signal to modulate another signal the ADC is good at capturing. And that's exactly what Digitech did. They designed a 20 kHz square wave oscillator using one op amp, and then used another op amp to control the amplitude of the oscillator based on the phototransistor signal. Now remember, the DSP chip is receiving samples from the audio ADC for both its left and right inputs. The left input contains our audio input signal, while the right input is our square wave oscillator, modulated by the expression pedal. The DSP processes and uses this expression pedal information directly in its signal processing algorithms, which is a pretty cool use of an extra bit of hardware, and cleverly avoids sending that data through the microcontroller first, when the microcontroller doesn't really need to have that data to begin with. Nice! So now let's talk about the digital portion of these pedals. It centers around a microcontroller that orchestrates the pedal's behavior based on the user's control inputs and a DSP chip, which processes the incoming audio. For most of the XP pedals, the microcontroller chip runs its code from an external EEPROM chip, programmed at the factory with the code for one particular model of the pedal. The EEPROM is interfaced to the microcontroller through a latch connected between the data and low address signals, with a logic converter that controls when the latch captures data. This is typical of Intel's microprocessor chips introduced in the late 1970s, including the famous 8085, 8086, and 8088 microprocessors used in early personal computers. This multiplexing trick reduced the number of address pins on the chip, leaving more pins for other functions. There are some builds of the pedal, some XP100s, that don't have an EEPROM for program storage, but instead a microcontroller with a built-in ROM. In that case, they change the resistors connected to the microcontroller's EA signal. EA tells the microcontroller whether to look for program code internally or externally. For the built-in ROM variants, R38 is installed, and so EA is pulled up to 5 volts. For pedals with external EEPROMs, resistor R47 is installed, and EA is pulled down to 0 volts. The double EEPROM that stores user preferences is here. It stores a grouping of effects programs for faster access and also holds the expression pedal calibration data. It communicates serially with the microcontroller in a way that is similar to SPI, but not quite. There's another latch chip that captures the microcontroller's data bus depending on the right signal. The latch drives the anodes of the seven segment LED display. This is how the microcontroller lights up the display segments. There are two digits in the display, and each digit is made up of eight segments. The anodes of the two digits are wired in parallel, segment for segment, and the cathodes of each digit are wired in common. The microcontroller can choose which digit to light up by using its P1.0 and P1.1 signals to pull all of one digit's cathodes to ground. By rapidly alternating which digit is lit up, the microcontroller can control both digits with only 10 signals instead of 16. The microcontroller does this fast enough that I can't see it happening. I was curious how fast it was, so I checked with my oscilloscope, and it looks like each of the digits is lit up for about 1.6 milliseconds in a 3.2 millisecond cycle. That's a 313 hertz refresh rate. In addition to selecting the LED digit to light up, P1.0 and P1.1 also provide a way to read switches SW1 and SW2, the two foot switches on the front of the pedal. There are diodes between the switches and the LED cathode transistors, which prevent the switches from interfering with the LED refresh process. When one of the switches is closed, the respective P1.0 or P1.1 signal passes through the read signal, pulling it low if P1.0 or P1.1 is low at the time. If neither switch is closed, the R60 pull-up resistor holds read at 5 volts. SW3 is the most boring of the switches. It's the one on the side of the unit used to group together effects programs for quicker access. The switch is wired directly to a microcontroller pin and is pulled up to 5 volts by resistor R57. When the switch is closed, the signal going to the microcontroller drops to 0 volts. Like I said, boring. 
There's a 12 megahertz oscillator made of a crystal and a few logic inverters. This is typical for older microcontrollers that don't have a complete crystal oscillator peripheral built in. The funny thing is, this microcontroller does have a built-in crystal oscillator. Why wouldn't they have used it? One guess is that the XP100 variants with built-in program ROM might not have a built-in oscillator. But I looked up the datasheet for that part, the 83C154, and it too has a built-in oscillator, so I guess that's not it. Another idea is that, historically, crystal oscillators could be a bit unreliable, so maybe Digitech preferred to use a discrete design they knew would work well every single time instead of relying on the oscillator circuit inside the microcontroller chip. Since they had three logic inverter gates left over from the six in the U14 chip, they figured it cost them almost nothing to use a discrete oscillator circuit, so why not? Only Digitech knows for sure. Here is the reset circuit, and it's totally old school, built out of discrete components. Microcontrollers these days have most of this stuff built in, or you can buy a single chip reset circuit that takes the place of most of these components. But why do we need a reset circuit anyway? Many microcontrollers, especially older ones, don't wait until their supply voltage is correct before they try to run their code. And they don't wait until their clock source, the crystal oscillator, is stable at the correct frequency. If the supply voltage is too low or the clock isn't stable, the logic in the microcontroller won't operate correctly it will do all sorts of random, peculiar, potentially undesirable things. A reset circuit is designed to hold the microcontroller in a reset state long enough for the supply voltage and clock oscillator to stabilize. This reset circuit is a popular design. A resistor slowly charges a large capacitor when the device is first powered on. The resistor and capacitor are chosen to take much longer to charge than the power supply and oscillator take to stabilize. But the gentle slope of the rising voltage across the capacitor is too gentle for the microcontroller to see as a single transition from the reset state to the run state, especially if there's electrical noise about. This can cause glitches that can leave the microcontroller in an invalid state. So there are a couple of logic converters to sharpen up the edge of the reset signal before it goes into the microcontroller and prevent reset glitches. Last, we get to the digital signal processing chip. As I've mentioned before, this takes the digital audio from the ADC, processes it according to whatever effect the user has chosen, and sends the result out through the DAC. It also receives and processes the expression pedal's position, and based on that position, alters the effect in some way. The DSP chip has a bidirectional serial link to the microcontroller. This is how the microcontroller configures the DSP chip and switches the DSP between effects programs. Attached to the DSP are up to four dynamic RAM chips. The XP100 and XP200 pedals have only one chip, or 32 kilobytes of RAM, while the XP300 and XP400 have 128 kilobytes. Let's assume the audio samples are 16 bits and use the audio sampling rate we uncovered earlier. With that, we can calculate that the XP100 and 200 have 350 milliseconds worth of audio buffer, while the XP300 and 400 have about 1.4 seconds. That's not a lot, but it's enough. That's it for this video. We dove deep into the design of these digital effects pedals and uncovered a few peculiar and interesting things along the way. In the next video, I want to start with a basic modification, combining the code for all the pedal models into a single pedal. There will be some circuit board design, flash programming, and maybe some 8051 firmware disassembly and hacking. I hope you're enjoying this journey. Please like this video to help it reach more people Leave a comment if you have questions or suggestions, and subscribe to see what I get up to next. Thanks for watching.